Hi, everyone. This is Phil Yeager, and welcome to CPA Review and More. And once again, we're not talking about CPA Review today. We're talking about more. And we have a very interesting guest who we'll get to in a second. But as you know, and I've told you on many occasions, that my wife is a Parkinson's patient. And I try to raise money for the Parkinson's Foundation through the Michael J. Fox Foundation for Parkinson's. And they develop drugs and all that. And uh, if you don't know Michael J. Fox is, which is possible, all right, he did all those back to the future. It's amazing. I, younger people don't even know who he is. That's what that what's amazes me. But anyway, please go to Michael J. Fox Foundation on the internet and give whatever you can. Dollar, two dollars, five dollars. And you know what? You'll feel better after you do it. And don't forget that. At the end, I'm just going to mention once again about CPA Review for about a second. And, but the guest today, and by the way, we have scanned the globe here looking for exciting guests, okay? All right. And I would say this gentleman is the most exciting guest we've had. All right. His wow. name is, now we're going to start this off bad because I'm going to mispronounce his first name. It's Shaheen, right? Yeah. Shaheen. And the last, it looks like Cheyenne. Is it, it looks like that. If you look at it, Shaheen, pronounce your name for everybody. Shaheen Shan. Well, that's pretty good. Okay. All right. Anyway, Shaheen is originally, he was born in Iran. Okay. And for those of you who remember, all right, there was a big problem between the United States, Iran. We put a dictator in there. Correct me if my history is wrong. And then there was a revolt. And that's when the, I uh, remember that. Didn't they take prisoners back then? the uh, uh, whatever his name was. But anyway, all right. Ever since then, we placed someone in there and I didn't, I don't, whether it's right or wrong, it's so long ago. All right. But you left Iran, your whole family left Iran. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. And what happened as far as, you know, did you, what did your family do when they left? Our, what did they leave in Iran? Well, I we came to the United States right after the Iranian Revolution, and we were solid middle class in Iran coming to the United States, realizing that we were no longer middle class. We were poor. My dad had to take a bunch of odd jobs working at a pizza place. He later uh, worked at a dry cleaners, which ended up owning years later, and we managed to buy a home in a area that was up and coming. And it was, you know, the one house that they could afford in that area and they managed to buy it. And I, I noticed all this wealth coming up around me and I wanted a path to it. And there was no path set for me other than become a doctor, which I didn't want to do. Um, uh, going through all those years of schooling did not appeal to me. So I decided to leave home. I left home and went about to find my fame and fortune on my own. I had no money. I had nowhere to live. I had nothing, no support system. And I managed to get involved in the electronic music scene in those days. I managed to invent a alternative to one of the most popular party drugs of the time called ecstasy. Mm -hmm. And by the time which was I, illegal, it was illegal then. Am I right? Ecstasy was illegal. My and alternative was legal. Okay, legal. All right. Well, yeah. Just my, I, my, I'm just curious. You left. You just left your house. You didn't have any money. Nope. All right. And uh, where was this in California? Yeah, I was in Los Angeles. Yeah. Okay. A, we were living in a suburb called Pacific Palisades. Oh, in, very. In that's Los a very Angeles. nice area. Yes. Now yes, it yes. is. Back when we got our home in the 1980s, it was a hippie commune type of type of place. It was a very hippie place to live. People didn't really want. It, it wasn't an affluent part of town. And then as gentrification happened, we're living there, and uh, you know the the neighborhood became gentrified. Okay. And, and so you, you went there and you started off with uh, ecstasy. What did you do with the ecstasy? Were you in ecstasy? What, what did you do with it? Well, I invented a pill. I distributed it through the drug dealers in those days at the various clubs. And we went from one guy to a thousand guys to 10,000 guys who now were distributing a legal product outside of a illegal excuse product. Me, it was a legal product? A legal, 100% legal product. How did you go to get it to be legal? First of all, who are these people who said 
they could convert it to a legal drug. Who are they? I, me, I did. I came up with the product. And I, I basically decided that I was going to invent an alternative to ecstasy, which is what I did using natural herbs and supplements. So that's how it became, that's how it became to be. And it was legal at that time. Now, do you have any prior training uh, doing with the, uh, you know, the chemicals, drugs? How did my, you know how to create this thing? My only prior training was as a ninja, ninja Jedi Knight. I had no <laughs> previous okay. training whatsoever. I'm joking. I had no previous training whatsoever. I was a kid. I was in my teens. And I managed to get enough good people around me who knew how to do that. And I asked, I borrowed, I begged. And enough people were willing to help me, people who had that specialized knowledge that I needed to get to where I was going. And lo and behold, by the time I'm in my late teens, this is the early 90s, I have over 200 employees, offices in 32 countries, and the company had broken over a billion dollars in revenue. This is pre-internet, pre-social media, pre-mobile phones. And it became a, a global movement, a global phenomenon. And I was on Newsweek and all the talk shows. And I had a collection of exotic cars. And I had homes on the beach in Malibu. And I was, I was doing incredibly well. Uh, were you a publicly held company in any way? Did you, where'd you get your investors from? There were no investors. My investors were me, was having a product that I could produce for 25 cents, resell for $25 cash business. Now, fast forward, think about this. I was sleeping in an abandoned car, sleeping in abandoned buildings, had no money to my name, no idea what I was going to do six months, eight months before. Now I'm making hundreds of millions of dollars literally over the course of a year. I've got a collection of exotic cars. I'm traveling around with celebrities and rock stars and living that life. And the news breaks that we made a billion dollars. And so I walk into the office, Sam Donaldson, the great Nightline reporter is outside waiting yeah, to interview me. And that's online mm -hmm. if anybody wants to watch it. I was a long haired uh, youth, long haired teenager. That's me on the cover of my book right there. And uh, by the way, anyone that's interested to learn more about this story, my book, Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult is out now on Amazon, Audible, okay. or whatever books. All right. Please talk about that towards the end. You know, tell us, we want so, you to plug the book. Go ahead. So what happened was, was that we broke the billion dollar mark. I step into the office. I learned two valuable lessons during that day. The first lesson is I didn't understand how much a billion dollars was. I literally did not know how much a billion dollars was, how many zeros it had, what it meant, how much money it was. I didn't understand. Remember, I had a grade school education. The second lesson I learned, and this is a good one for you because I know you're a CPA, is that I needed an accountant. I thought to myself, fuck, man, we've made a billion dollars and I don't have a fucking accountant. And the important lesson for your uh, viewers, the ones that are not accountants to learn, and that I learned on that day, um, and something you might know something about, is that accountants are not, not the guys that separate the pills and the cash from the duffel bags that are stacked in your office and give you a count on the actual cash. Of course I, not. I learned that okay. very quickly. All right. And everything was on the up and up with this, right? Everything was on the up and up. Well, uh, you, you, yeah, it's either it was sort of was it a gray area or was it on the up and up? What it depends what you mean by up and up in in our well, uh, uh, let me tell you, ecstasy we know is illegal. It was, yes. I, I believe, it's still all right. And you came up with this pill, right? Yes. And the pill must have contained ecstasy. Am I correct? No. The pill contained herbs that mimic herbs. the effects. Oh, okay. Right. So you found, oh, so you found out what herbs make up the ecstasy, right? Yeah. So, and you made it into a pill. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm jotting this down because I might start this business. Go ahead. Go ahead. You got to get to read my book, buddy. So I will. I will. I will. Wh what I did. So again, so there was a party drug going on at that time called ecstasy. I'm going to take a wild guess since you're 70, you said 72, 76, 76. Okay. 
since you're 76, maybe you haven't had the experience of enjoying ecstasy. No, I haven't. Probably. Copy that. Not recently. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. So ecstasy is a designer drug and an illegal designer drug that is very powerful and very empathetic. It's, it's a decent drug. Now, I don't espouse anybody take any drugs, do anything, take anything without talking to your doctor. So talk to your doctor before you take anything. Now, what I invented was a legal alternative to ecstasy. It was a combination of natural organic herbs and organic materials that we put in there, herbs, minerals, supplements to mimic the effect. And this was not illegal. So if what okay. you mean by up and up is, was it, was it illegal? The right, answer well, that that is no, that it was sense. legal. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, wh where did you start selling this? Uh, these, uh, first of all, you, you de developed these, uh, uh, these herbal, the herbs that actually make up the ecstasy, correct? Yeah. All right. And you developed what you did and who's the first company who decided, did you, you didn't sell it yourself door to door, you were knocking on doors. How did you sell this product initially? Well, buddy, you know, I, I think, well, I, I, I think I did sell it door to door. And I think initially it went through the club scene, the club scene, the rave scene, the party scene. And what I did was I enlisted the drug dealers. That was what I was telling you in the beginning. So I was at the right place at the right time. During this time in the 1990s, the supply of drugs had dried up. The supply of ecstasy, which was produced in two countries, primarily England and Holland, had been stymied. It was not coming into the United States. So you had this distribution circuit of dealers, low-level dealers in the clubs who had nothing to sell. There's an opportunity there. So I went to them and I gave them the prospect of selling a legal drug. And to that, they joyously said yes. From there, we went on to sell in brick and mortar, 7-Eleven, GNC. Uh, we were selling in, in Walmart, Wal uh, Warehouse Records. Larry Flint was selling it into all the sex stores. So we were a pretty uh, racy product, but we were also selling into traditional avenues of brick and mortar. And again, by the time I was in my late teens, we were in close to 32,000 doors all over the world. I had offices in 32 countries. I had over 200 employees. And there were, I write about it in my book, several investment banks interested in taking us public through an IPO. Really? That's interesting. Yes. What you, I'm just curious. What, what was your father doing in Iran? What was his occupation? All right, are you ready? Is your seatbelt on, Phil Yeager? Uh, no, it isn't, but go ahead anyway. <laughs> <laughs> My dad, Phil Yeager, in Iran, worked for a small accountancy firm called Coopers and Librin. Have you Libranth. heard of them? Librinth, yeah. Librinth, yes. Oh, yeah, they were around. Big eight. There you That's go. What they call them all the big eight, you know? Yep. And, my and mom then they got, for... in they got involved in litigation. All right. And then it left, we called them the final four. Oh, is that right? <laughs> See, sort of like I know nothing school. about that world. But well, it's not important anyway. But no, I, I know Cooper's library very well. Go ahead. There you go. And my mom so worked he, for Lockheed as a secretary. Really? Was your father a chartered account or just a plain India yeah. that had chartered, like CPAs were with chartered accounts? All right. He, didn't, he was not, he just worked there. Okay. As an account. So here's the thing with my dad. All I'm trying right. to think where you're getting all this business sense from, you know? I got no business sense from my dad. Here's the thing with my dad. Love the guy to death. I have never seen him solve a math problem. He <laughs> had zero idea of any of my math homework coming here to the United States. He barely spoke English. He learned English. You know, honest, hardworking, Jewish, Iranian, American, you know, a Jewish, Iranian, American guy. But I'm sorry, I never understood. He was Jewish? He was Jewish? Yeah. Oh, I we were, know we're, we're Iranian Jews. Oh, I'd like to see what your Passover Seder is like. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> we, the Iranians have epic uh, holidays and because you've got dual culture. So you've got the Iranian culture and then you have the Jewish culture. And culturally, uh, you know, Iranian Jews are the oldest Jews. Most people don't know this. That pre it predates the reason why they say Judaism predates all these other Judeo-Christian religions, maybe not some of the 
uh, paganistic or uh, animistic religions, but certainly all the other Judeo-Christian religions is because of the Iranian Jews. They found evidence of the oldest Jews in Iran. So, you know, my, my dad was always a hardworking guy, but never the best at math or maybe not the best accountant. I don't know. I don't know. I mean, I know he had these uh, like ledgers that he wrote by hand and he had the calculator with the rolls of. Things. Oh, yeah, I remember like, that. <laughs> yeah, he had all that. He's got all that stuff. But it's old school. You're talking about a guy that, you know, was born in the 1940s and grew up in Iran. So he's got to be about my age, I would think. What, yeah. what does he do? He's retired now. Exactly or? right. I hope it's okay. I call you dad. Call me dad. Call me. Call me. <laughs> call me Jay. Call me Ray. Remember that one? You call me Ray. Call me Jay. Guy. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Call me dad. All right. Or uh, I'm trying to think. Uh, what would be a Yiddish term for that? I can't think of that. Go ahead. Uh, see, in New York, you grew up in the New York area. All my neighbors were Italian Catholics, you know, and yet. They would come over and say, you know, Phil, you're a mensch. OK, and uh, which is a nice, decent guy. And uh, I, I can just tell you one thing. I was on a radio show uh, in, in Manhattan called Cousin Brucey. He's still still around after all these years. Yeah. Anyway, I, I co-hosted with him. I won a contest. So I co-hosted with him. And then I said, you know, Bruce, you're a mensch. And then the people called in. They want to know what's a mensch now. People in New York who are not Jewish know what dementias are, but that has nothing to do with what you do. All right, so let's go on. I want to get to the, uh, I don't want to, let's talk. The next thing, you invented cigarettes. Herbal cigarettes. So Herbal. I, look, Phil, my entire life has been based around looking at. We froze for a second. Hold on. Yeah, are you frozen? I'm not frozen. Uh, now, can... No, I, you have you froze and you get the uh, ice is melting as, as we talk. So Am I frozen? Right. Can you hear me? No, you're fine. You're fine. Go ahead. Okay, good. Right. Sorry. Your about world that. Uh, or whatever was centered around. Yeah. My entire career has been surrounded uh, and, and based on finding problems in, in various marketplaces, finding a niche and then dominating that niche by addressing that big problem. So the first problem I, I solved was that people like to go out, people like to party. There was no supply of illicit drugs. So I created a natural one that was legal. The second was that I created the first herbal cigarette. It was, uh, and is to this day, the standard for Hollywood studios, because you know, on the sets, people can't smoke tobacco every scene after scene. It makes their throats harsh. So I came up with a cigarette that did that. After that, I invented all the technology for portable digital vaporization. I patented it. I wrote the book on it, and it led to what people use today as vapes and, and vaporization technology. Right. And subsequent to that, I do what I do now, which is help Jeff Bezos inspire people to make money by teaching people how to use the Amazon platform. Uh, this beautiful business that Jeff Bezos has built, Amazon, will create more millionaires and billionaires in our time than any other disruptive e-commerce environment. And so I've been dedicated for the past 10 plus years to teaching people how to start these Amazon businesses and create recurring streams of cash flow, recurring streams of revenue so they can give their middle finger to their boss and go out there and work for themselves. Now, uh, we skipped over the cigarettes. So that's fine. But uh, I just want to know, can you tell us, uh, I don't know what you can share with us, but the last company you brought to market on Amazon, correct? All right. Yeah. Can you tell us what that company was? That I brought on Amazon? So yeah. we have a company now called Accelerated Intelligence. And Accelerated Intelligence is one of the big Amazon sellers. So what most people don't know is when you buy something on Amazon, you may be buying from Amazon, but more likely you're buying from one of 5 million third-party sellers. People like me and you, Phil, accountants, lawyers, doctors, uh, real estate agents, oil engineers, stay-at-home moms, soccer moms, soccer dads, whatever it is, because anybody can start an Amazon business. And my company, which is where I make most of my money these days, is finding innovative products and strategies and selling those products on the Amazon platform. What most people don't know is that anybody in a very short amount of time with very little money 
can start one of these Amazon businesses and have it really be just another piece of real estate that creates predictable, recurring cash flow. And it's day one. We are at the very beginning of this massive trend. And I invite everybody, your viewers, your listeners, even yourself, my friend, to start getting involved in starting an Amazon business. Tell us how one uh, starts. All right. First of all, you're a consultant. You get a fee for setting them up. How do you, how do you make your money, if I may ask you? I'm expensive. I do consulting for Fortune 50s, Fortune 500s, and venture-backed startups. I charge $55,000 and $1,250 an hour. There's people under me. I've got associates that charge at less. Um, but what happened was I was doing this for a number of years for Fortune 50s, Fortune 500s, teaching people, how do you find a product? How do you get that product on the first page of Amazon? How do you get reviews? How do you get ranked? How do you get people to continually buy your product and subscribe to it and to create these streams of revenue? And people were like, Shaheen, we would love to do this, but we can't afford to pay you. You're ridiculously expensive. And I said, yeah, I know. It's, it's insane that people pay me this. And there's a line around the, around the block waiting to get in. So what I did, Phil, is I created a online course that anybody could take. Uh, it is absolutely free. It's normally 200 bucks for anybody who is listening using the code CPA. We're going to give it free, Phil Yeager. It's a one hour course, tells you everything you want to know A to Z. How do you start an Amazon company? Where to incorporate? All that good stuff. And maybe they can come to you for their tax planning. Um, and if anybody's interested, I'm going to give out my email is darkzess at gmail.com. D A R K. Z-E-S-S at gmail.com. Use the code CPA in the subject heading, and I will give you my one-hour course on how to become a master at selling on Amazon for free. And that's what I do now. I inspire people to sell and create these Amazon businesses. Okay. And we'll get that and put that on the screen. Okay. So, uh, you know, people will see it, but uh, people will say, wait a minute, no one gives away anything for nothing. All right. Is that true? All right. This is all free. You're, how many how many of these do you do that you give away for free? Thousands, tens of thousands. Thousands. OK. Yeah. All right. Well, let's. All right. Can you take give me and there's an tens of thousands of others that have paid thousands of dollars? Well, free sounds a lot better, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Another big word that goes out there to a lot of people is discount. They like the word discount, right? Discount. Yeah. Free. I mean, look, right. I, I learned a while ago that if you want to get people engaged, you got to remove the barriers to them getting successful. Most people feel just get in their own way. I look at so many people, so many people that are just in their own way, in their own way about how they're not being frugal in life, how they get a little bit of money and they get a fancy apartment and food and cars and like they're spending all their money. And then people look at me and they're like, I go to happy hour at the local restaurant here and they go, Shaheen, you're a millionaire. You drove, you drove up in a, in a, in a brand new Porsche. That car's worth $300,000 and you're coming to the happy hour. And I say, yeah, how do you think I afford the Porsche? That's how it works. And then I see other people where, you know, a lot of actors in LA, we've got a friend who's an actress and this girl makes a little bit of money acting, you know, a couple hundred grand, you know, she's, she's, getting to be fairly well known. And she goes off and she spends 50 grand buying her, her nine-year-old clothing and you think designer clothing and spending money and getting a, a fancy apartment and, and all this stuff. And I'm like, man, you know, you're just getting in your own way. You're getting in your own way. You need to invest. You need to build foundational wealth. And then from the money that you get from that foundational wealth, then you can buy the luxury. And, and as you know, that luxury becomes a write-off if you do it right. But oh, people well, just okay. people get in their own way. So, so as coaches, as people who inspire people, we have to try to take out those barriers to entry. So it's easy as possible for them to start this stuff. Now, a mom pa, a smaller business, mom and pa business, okay? Yeah. They want to get into this Amazon store, okay? Now, uh, you, are you going to charge them a consulting fee? No, no. They can just 
email me dark at gmail.com okay. i'll give right. them the course for free it's everything you need where everything to incorporate you- where uh, how do you start your business how do you get reviews how do you find a product most people's like i can't find a product how do you find a product we teach you how to do that we do all of that for free now I have a platinum mastermind. I've got one-on-one coaching. I've got all this other stuff that we offer, which is an extra fee, which is optional. But if you reach out to us, all you need is in that one-hour course. And you enclose a bottle of the pills? What's that? You enclose a bottle of the, pe- of the pills? I'll include a bottle enjoying? of the pills just, <laughs> just for you, buddy. <laughs> no, I didn't say for me. I mean, you know, I- I'm just happy. I'm happy on life anyway, you know. Uh, but... Uh, Anyway, let's go. So I come to you. I, I you know, I, whatever I do, I, I come to you, your people, and say, I have an idea for an Amazon store. Okay? Tell me where I'm going wrong. All right. Now, I, you know what? I want to put my entire course on Amazon and sell all the components of it. Okay? All right. Now, let's talk about what everyone's going to take of uh when I sell the different components, okay? All right, first of all, that can be done, can it? Right, so what, what, you, what you, I think maybe a better example is you say, hey, I'm an accountant right now, and I'd like to have another stream. I've got some real estate. I'm sure you got some real estate, Phil, a good Jewish accountant. You're going to have some real estate, right? So you've got some, some cash flow that's coming in from that. You probably have some money in the market. So that's bringing in some compounded interest, especially if you're in dividends and those types of things. So you've got two good foundations, two good pillars. You probably have a little bit of a savings, a 401k, a defined benefits plan, pension plan, whatever. Fantastic. Love to hear that. Okay. Real estate's at an all-time high. Why not build another form of real estate. And so what you do is you come to me and I show you how to find a product. Now, what we do is we look at the market. We see what the market needs. Now you're like, Shaheen, I'm busy. I'm a successful accountant. I, I don't have time. No problem. We utilize the time of virtual assistants in South and Central America, in India. These people are MBA quality uh, employees that would be delighted for a fraction They would be delighted to work for a fraction of what you would pay somebody here in the United States. And they will work so hard for you, especially if you try. I think they call that outsourcing, correct? Outsourcing. That's outsourcing. So we we build out a team for you. We help you build out a team of winners that will run this business for you. And Amazon will handle the rest. They will pick, pack, and ship your product. They will advertise it. They will get you the eyeballs. They will do all the stuff that you need to do. And then you just sit back and you collect cash flow. And it becomes another source of recurring revenue. What percentage does Amazon take of the sale? So it depends. It's different on different products. Roughly, we can look at a 25% gross margin. Okay. All right. And now when I came up with my idea, uh, is there a reason (laughs) you sort of skipped over to say, I'm just curious, if it's a niche market, then I'm Yeah, you're talking about about a digital product and Amazon may not be the best place. Yes and no. No, we have books. We have, well, you consider books, uh, they're digital, yeah, okay. The quickest way to go broke is to sell a book, buddy. Because you're selling something for 20 bucks, 30 bucks. How much do people value a book? And what's the cost of print? How do you Sorry, get it out there? Cancel those book orders. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, a book, book is good as an authority piece. Book is good as a calling card. Book is good as a way to disseminate information. Look, you're talking to a guy who's spent the last several years. Yeah, what, what is the cost of that book, by the way? You want to share that? Uh... My book? I don't know how much the cost. It's probably like 20 bucks. Uh, it's That's called... Cool. Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult. Uh, again, how, many, how, many, how many books have you actually, has Amazon sold, do you know? Thousands. Thousands. So yeah. you're getting, you get royalties off of that too? No, we, uh, we yes, we do get royalties. It is published with a, a local publisher and there's a split on the money. I guess you'd call it a royalty. So we do get a royalty. Amazon takes their cut. But, you know, that's that's a really hard way to get rich. The easier way would be, Phil, you and I are going to start looking at the market for candlesticks. I see you got some crystal candlesticks behind you. And we're oh, going to see. Yeah, they're, they're crystal from our crystal mines we have in Africa. 
There you go. Oh, I don't know what so, they are. So, so we're going to start looking at, at, at those on Amazon. Well, we noticed that those aren't selling very well, so we're not going to pursue that. But the candles that go inside them, man, there's really a market for that. We can spy the sales of our competitors and notice that competitors are doing $100,000, $200,000, $300,000 a month selling those candles. In fact, Hanukkah candles, believe it or not, were going for $9 a box on Amazon during this time. So I say, Phil, you know what? Me and you, we're going to sell Hanukkah candles. And now we contact a manufacturer in China on Alibaba. We get them to produce these Hanukkah candles for us. Surprise, surprise. Uh, they what only was cost- name? Alibaba? I Alibaba. Had sell, I had to sell that stock. It was, yeah. it was really going down. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but awesome. about but 25 anyway, cents a unit, we're going to purchase them. We're going to sell them on Amazon for $7.99. And we're going to give them a few X or we're going to give them enough Hanukkah candles for next year's Hanukkah candles. And now we've got a value. We're going to brand them great. We're going to get your rabbi there, uh, Phil, to, uh, to endorse them. So they're going to be authority behind them. So they're going to be a special candle and they're going to come in better colors and they're going to be kosher candles because he's going to bless them in, in, all, in all kosherness. And okay. so now we've got a product that has a competitive advantage and we're selling it for less. And now we take over market share. We start moving in. We're making 20000 a month, 50000 a month, 100000 a month. And sure, Amazon takes their, their portion, but we're still left with 25% gross margin. And that's phenomenal on a product that you, you make in for, for cents and sell them for dollars. You have any, you have any people who have done that with the Hanukkah candles? Probably a lot. It was an example off the top of my head. <laughs> just, I'm just curious. That's all that was. I have, no, I have no idea, but I do know that there was a shortage this Hanukkah. Well, there's a shortage of everything, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> was there a distribution? Are they someplace on Long Beach, California, those Hanukkah candles on a barge? Is that what the, pro- no, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. There's <laughs> a lot of stuff on those barges. That is true. Good observation. You have any, pr- I, well, I didn't think it was good, but uh, let me ask you something. Are you having distribution problems uh, with what you are, the products you are in? Well, look, I've been in this game since 2010. So myself and my students uh, plan ahead and we've planned ahead for the last 10 years. So we're doing okay. But everybody was hit by, by the COVID bug and it was very disruptive to business. But on the same token, we did really well because everybody's staying at home ordering products on Amazon. Oh, yeah, that's right. Everyone had nothing else to do. Yeah, right. that's right. Uh, by the way, are you getting a, uh, a a seat on the next rocket up to space with Jeff? His big Bezos? penis flying into the air? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think I like it here. I'm more of an ocean guy, buddy. I'm not oh. so much of a going to the sky kind of guy. But I do know people that have put in bids for that that are, that are interested. You, there's a waiting list for all of those. I think Virgin is probably the most likely one that you could get ahead of time. But again, you know, it's, it's money that I don't need to be spending. I'd rather put that money into my businesses, into creating cash flow, recurring revenue, which is what I'm all about. How successful, do you, have, do you keep track of this at all? What's the success of these Amazon businesses? Very successful. Like I said, there will be more millionaires and billionaires made in the next 10 years from the Amazon platform than any other business. Look, Phil, if me and you, you're like, buddy, I'm 76. I got my grandkids. I got my kids. I'm tired of this shit. I'm fucking going to retire. But I'd, li- I'd like to have a couple businesses that'll bring in a little bit of legacy wealth for my family. So we start looking. You look at a restaurant. Where, where are you, Phil? Where, where are you located? Uh, right outside of uh, Washington, D.C. area. All right. So in D.C., you go, you know what? I want to open up a small family-owned restaurant. That's what we're going to do. We're going to sell latkes and uh, gefilte fish and, and matzo ball soup and all that. What's it going to cost you? I'm to- very religious. No, no, no. What's, what's, what's it going to cost to open up a restaurant? You're looking two, oh, three hundred grand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A quarter of a million. Yeah. A quarter that. of a million if you're lucky. And that's not we're not talking fancy restaurant. Is this it's- a good time to open up a restaurant? Seriously. Listen, we are talking mom and pop. Okay, terrible time to open up a restaurant. Right. Now, you say, okay, well, I'm going to open up a dry cleaners. Same thing, at least 250 to 500, right? And how long with any a coin laundry, a car wash? Car wash could be a million bucks for a basic car wash. 
Okay. You, and you don't own the land. And the, let me tell you, restaurants, you got a less than a 10% chance of success. And all those other businesses, eh, maybe higher chance with like a coin laundry or a car wash or something, but they fail all the time too. And how long is it going to take you to recapture the half a million bucks you just put into that car wash, that restaurant? You're talking 10, 15 years, buddy. This is, okay. this is, not, this is not something where you capture that money right away. Now, let's look at the chance of you getting rich on that. Let's look at the chance of Phil Jr. or Phil Jr.'s son being like, man, this is legacy wealth. Thanks, Dad, for opening up this restaurant. It's probably not in the books, man. It's probably he'll be he'll be itching to sell it and get back about what you put into it minus uh, depreciation and uh, uh, deflation and all that stuff. Right. Inflation. So. Let's look at an Amazon business. What's it cost to start an Amazon business? I next, don't know. What does it cost? Next to nothing. Five grand. Yeah. Can you take a 5,000? Yeah. Can you just take a product that you can think of? I mean, maybe that's on and say, all right, uh, let's set up the Amazon. Yeah. Let's call it widgets like everyone else does. Okay. We want to sell widgets. Is that a fair example? No, we can use a better example. We can say, okay. tea. but look, you, so you spend five grand, 10 grand, you start an Amazon business. That's your risk, buddy. Five to 10 grand. That's it. What do Amazon businesses bring in? How much revenue? I've got products that are making millions of dollars. And I can show this to you a month. I've got students that are making hundreds of thousands of dollars. It is crazy how much you can make per month selling on Amazon. Now, what are the chances of you getting rich? Amazon companies are going for multiples of EBITDA higher than brick and mortar businesses. You got a restaurant, what are you going to get? Three times, two and a half times, something like that? I, I think that's high, but possibly. Yeah. No, no. Go ahead. I'll let you go. go ahead. There's no, Amazon continue. businesses now going for six to 10 times EBITDA. What give me a business that would that's doing that? Can you think of one? A tea business, one of our tea businesses. We, tea, we, oh, manu- you sell tea also. We manufacture tea, we're one of the biggest manufacturers of tea on Amazon. We make all types of teas, green oh, teas. Can you mention the name of the sure? Company? Our main brand is Matcha DNA. People can search for Matcha, Matcha DNA. DNA. <laughs> yeah, it's the best. I the love best the way you have the tea. DNA. After. That's good. I like yeah, that. the best green tea in the world. Ours is ours is spectacular. People love it. Uh, phenomenal health benefits. I mean, I, I don't think I can espouse them as being the president of the company, but you can just Google it and look it up. People having all kinds of dramatic uh, health benefits from taking products like ours. So, uh, so you're you know, we, into herbal. It sounds like you're into herbal things, correct? Yes. Now, can I ask you a question? These vipers, right? Vapors. Uh, vapors. Sorry. Viper right. is a snake. Tells you how much yeah. I smoke. You, all right. Yeah, go ahead. All right. Anyway. Uh, uh, that really, that can cause cancer just like cigarettes, can it? That I don't know. Look, I don't, I invented those things, but I don't espouse the use of them. Why? Because I feel the human lungs are intended to take in one thing, clean, fresh air. That's it. And anything else you put in there is going to be uh, not good for your health. However, as a harm reduction measure, it could be okay. If you want to get into it, I can, I can tell you about it. You know, when I invented vaporization, digital vaporization, I looked at the problem that whoa, people whoa, have what's been- What's digital? I never heard the term. Digital? Yeah, uh, digi- Go ahead. I'll, I'll explain. Tell me. So people have been smoking for 5,000 plus years. Since the dawn of time, some dude was clubbing people over the head with a bone and, and dragging them into a cave and then inhaling tobacco or whatever. We've been doing it since the dawn of time. What's the problem? Well- You burn the plant because you heat it up to a very high temperature, exposing it to an open flame, creating smoke, tar, and carbon monoxide, the three carcinogenic elements of smoking. Well, I wanted to solve this problem, so I thought about it, and I thought, man, what if you were to heat it to the point where it would release its volatile elements, the nicotine, the cannabinoids, whatever the medicine is that you want, but not to the point where it burns it. Turns out, if you can control the heat on the plant and heat it just to the point where it gives you what you want, but not to the point where it burns it, 
you avoid, for the most part, those carcinogenic elements. And, and thus, vaporization was born. I invented a device that did exactly that and a technology that allowed that to be possible. Now, fast forward, my company went public. I sold it. I exited it a long time ago. Fast forward to the technology we have now, things keep getting smaller and smaller and smaller. Well, in an effort to make it smaller, I won't bore you with the technology, but they had to add liquid because solids vaporize at a much lower rate. You got to heat it up much hotter and you can't do that with current battery technology, making it small, the size of a cigarette, because people want what they're familiar with. So when they went to create these little cigarettes looking vapes that people use, and making them tiny so they fit in a shirt pocket, well, they had to add a liquid. And it's that liquid that volatizes and vaporizes and looks like smoke when you're exhaling it that they added some other ingredients to. And turns out that sometimes those ingredients may not be the best things for your lungs. Now, do they cause cancer? That I don't know. Do they cause complications? Certainly seems like some of those ingredients may cause complications for some people. But it's. Uh, Aren't you it's, still taking in nicotine? Yeah, you still get nicotine if you're if if it if what you're smoking contains nicotine. Yeah. So I guess you're saying uh, you don't really know if it causes. You haven't had any. Uh, if you had scientists to look at your uh, really, uh, who do you? Yes. Who is this group you go to? I'm just curious. Which uh, group I go to? Well, you have you have this. Uh, this I haven't. This product. Yeah, I haven't been in that business for years. You're talking 2006, I exited from the vaporization business. But at that oh, time- Oh, you're not in. Okay, why did oh, you get yeah, out? At I'm that time, scared. we had- Why serious, did you get out? Why'd you get out? Well, I sold the company. I had an exit. For money. It was the money, it right? Was mo for money, yes. I do not work for peanuts, but yes. Although sometimes I feel like I do. <laughs> <laughs> That's it right. is we money, Phil. We are money. not elephants. We're not elephants. We don't work for peanuts. But uh, no, as, seriously, I mean, so you sold it to this company. Is this company still in business? Yeah, they're publicly traded. Publicly traded. And because, yeah. you know, uh, they've come out. Uh, I don't know how long ago I saw an ad about this or a public service announcement that, you know, that uh, those, those things can cause cancer like cigarettes can. You know, so I don't know. I can't speak to that, man. I, you know, what I can tell you is that people have been inhaling stuff since the dawn of time. Does it cause cancer? Maybe we know that smoking likely causes cancer, but that may not be an effect of nicotine. It, nicotine might not be a, a factor in that. If you look at indigenous cultures, the American Indians, the uh, uh, shamans in Brazil, all, all these different cultures who use tobacco as a medicine, they certainly didn't have any of that. So is it, is it the burning of the plants? Is it the chemicals they treat it with? Is it the uh, acetate filters? Could it be uh, 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 the, the chemicals that uh, all the stuff is processed with? Could it be the butane and the lighters people are using? I, I don't know is the answer. And anybody who's saying, I mean, you're honestly saying, I just don't know, or you're yeah. not saying, I don't know, because it, I mean, everyone says that cigarettes cause cancer. I mean, oh, uh, uh, yeah. yeah that, what I'm saying is um, what's your, what's your position on that? Do cigarettes yeah. cause cancer or they do not? Well, you're not well, sure. They certainly don't make you a better person. And personally, I find them odious. With that said. So you don't smoke, I assume. Hell no. I, I'm an <laughs> athlete. I, I, I go, I go out there. I, 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 I train martial arts. I, I run. I, I swim. That, so that, yeah. I do all that, all that great stuff. Why would I want to do that to myself? Where do you is find a, a the time to do those other things? I mean, you sound Every like day. you're on the go. No, I have all the time in the world. Are you kidding me? You do I have people. Yes, I use other you have people hours. doing the work for you, right? Yes. Is that? Yes, my business. So what is your I mean, if all these people are doing the work, you're doing the big negotiations, right? Is that what you do? Or I, you're the person who brings in the businesses to go on Amazon? What is your what do you do within the company? I'm just curious. You're a very successful businessman. What do you do versus uh, what do the other people, you know, uh, do to help you. You must have a lot of people working for you. Yeah. I build right? systems and I build teams. And then I do high level strategy. 
okay, and there's only 24 hours in a day. <laughs> do you yeah. do sleep? That's pretty good. I have sleep very any, well. If you've yeah, written oh, any yeah. books, are you going to write a book on how to organize oneself? Yeah, check out successful? my book, Billion, How I Became King of the Throw Pill Cult. It's in there. <laughs> now, the book is on, just what's the name of the book again? I'm going to want to write this down because I'm going to order it. Yeah, Billion, what? How I Became King of the Throw Pill Cult. Okay. okay. You look good right. for 76, Phil Yeager. I want to be like you when I'm 76. Well, that's because I still do ecstasy. And <laughs> 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 you want to know, this was the big thing. When I graduated college, this was the big thing. Marijuana. That was it. No one, you know, <laughs> now, uh, I remember hearing about ecstasy, you know, with the, uh, it was probably the, the group I don't know, maybe it was my generation, but uh, I had real problems smoking marijuana because I couldn't inhale. And, uh, but the one time I did, I was eating a Hershey chocolate, okay? That Hershey chocolate, after you smoked marijuana, it tastes like the best Swiss chocolate. <laughs> it really did. <laughs> all right. But, all right. So, anyway, very good. So, uh, what, is there a specific item or product that makes better for an Amazon type business? Yeah. Generally speaking, there are categories that you could be very successful in, but I'll, I'll give you a broader example. And that's the, the, of, of a mistake that most entrepreneurs make when they're selecting a product. And that's this, that most people think, Hey, I'm going to go out there into the marketplace. Most people think this. Hey, I'm going to go out there into the marketplace. I'm going to create the best product ever, and the world is going to beat its way to my door. Fact is, it doesn't work that way. The better way to do it is to spy on the market, spy on the competition, find what the market needs, and then tell a better story. Go in there and manipulate the market by bringing value, by bringing a better product. And that's what we teach. Again, Amazon Mastery, reach out to me, darkzess at gmail.com and mention CPA in the subject heading. I'll give you that course for free. How many people do what you do? I mean, I'm, I'm curious. There's over first, 5 million Amazon sellers right now. Your exact position of what you do, selling, Amazon, selling people, setting them up, they have that many people. There's 5 million people selling products on the Amazon platform. No, that was my question. How many yeah. people, uh, you don't work directly for Amazon. Am I correct? You have your own nope. company. I, How I'm many people really... are doing what you do? Uh, what's your competition like? Um, that's a good question. I, I, you know, There's other people who have Amazon courses and several of them are really good. And some of them are less than good. Um, I haven't taken account, but you're there probably is probably the best. There. You think you're the best? You probably are the best. I know I'm the best. You know, you have a, also, <laughs> if you write that book, uh, Power of Positive Thinking, too. Oh, oh, that was what's the thing. But no, no, you sound, ha, you are a very positive person, right? You Can you think you can succeed in anything? Or have you ever thought about going into something and you ever worry about failure? Does that ever come to you? No, there's things that I naturally won't be able to succeed at. For example, breastfeeding. I probably wouldn't be very good at that. So well, you know what they say, if you haven't tried it, you know, <laughs> <laughs> there, there's a series of things I'm bad at. Look, Phil, I am incredibly good at a very narrow band of things, maybe two things in, in, in life. I am incredibly competent at and everything else. I am one level below probably the lowest chimpanzee. I fail at math, my friend terrible at math, terrible at accounting. I know nothing about that, but I hire good people. I know nothing about like, well, that's I can't... important. That's important to yeah. hire good people. Right. Yeah. And to but... work hard, but not, I'm sorry, work smart, but not hard. Right. Yeah. A, a good friend of mine, Ken Rutowski loves this quote and he says it often is that an amateur might be cheap, but a professional is priceless. And it's true. That's a good comment. I like that quote. Good quote. Who is that person who asked? That's a buddy of mine. 
Did he write any books? Any books? No. He should. No, not yet. Uh, I could probably talk to you another hour. I don't know if you'd want to talk to me another hour, but <laughs> no. I, actually, I'm coming to California this summer, so uh, I'm coming to. Uh, I know Barbara Corcoran. Uh, you know who she is? Sure. sure so I, I, I come, t- I get in there to, to see the shark tanks. In. You know, very, she's a nice person. She tried to help me with my CPA review school. And then yeah. it, you know, she's not allowed to consult on anything other than the people who invest. How come they don't invite you on? I mean, you, you sound like you can invest in businesses. Have you been approached at all? Uh, not for Shark Tank, but I'd love to do it. Get me on. Talk to Barbara. All right. You know, I'll get you on. All right. Now, don't embarrass me now. Okay. Don't I'll make you proud, with Dad. Ex- don't. <laughs> <laughs> don't bring up the ecstasy pills initially. You know, we, you know, that's, no, that's, it seems like uh, it's amazing. Well, the people who've done very well on there are the sharks. They've done extremely well. But uh, anything else you want to share with us that I, I'm sure you could share for the rest of the day, but you know, anything else you want to say? First of all, tell us about your book. Tell us why people should buy your book. You shouldn't, you shouldn't, you should stay where you're at. Homeostasis. Don't move. Don't change. Keep your life the way it is. Never move forward or so get my saying, book. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> <laughs> you just say, stay where you are. Where, I, I, Billion. Right. How I became so, king of the thrill pill cult. But you're saying, don't on, buy, didn't you just say, don't buy my book? Yeah, don't buy my book. Why not? I don't know. It's like that guy. What was it? Uh, is it Jerry Rubin? Who, he said, steal this book. And it was the biggest pain in the ass. He wrote a book called, don't, he, he wrote a book called Steal This Book. And bookstores everywhere were furious. They had to lock up his books because people were actually coming in and stealing it. Um, Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult. Available on Amazon. Check out our show, Hack and Grow Rich, wherever podcasts are found and on YouTube. Is that and what is Hack and Go Rich? What, what Hack and Grow Rich is our show. We've got a show. We're getting close to about 100,000 subscribers on YouTube where we talk about unconventional hacks to getting rich. Additionally, yeah, do you, you fit that in what between 8 30 in the evening and say nine o'clock? I mean, I, I'm just trying to anyway. Would you like me to look you up when I get there and be saying no? I'll be very hurt. Yeah, do it. Make sure to make sure make sure to get a hold of me. Absolutely. Yeah. And buy the book first, and you'll put your address in the book. <laughs> there you go. So there you go. Good idea. I like that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, anybody again, if you're interested in the one hour course, learn how to sell on Amazon. Darkzess at gmail.com, D A R K Z E S S at gmail.com. If you want to check out my broader course, that is going to be FBA sellercourse.com, FBA standing for fulfillment by Amazon. And Phil, it's been fun being on. I really appreciate the opportunity. I enjoyed speaking with you, and you taught me something. I didn't know there were Iranian Jews. So I did know. I, you, you know, you do have a gift of gab. You know that. Thank you, buddy. I appreciate you. I mean, that as a compliment. Yeah. You know. Thank you so much. Appreciate all it. All right. And uh, please, you know, all these things you just said, watch this, watch that. Where uh, can you have, uh, I guess, is Brittany your person? Can we mm-hmm. get a list of these things? We could we could put them up. Yeah, it's all on the sheet that she sent you. Um, okay. But if well, you need more, just reach out to her. She'll send it to you in an email. Right. If that's I'll, okay. You know what? I didn't get those sheets. That's the whole thing. I just. Ah, OK. I had to go. Mm-hmm. I, yeah, I'll. I'll reach out to her and right. you know, we can put it on our site if you'd like. Love it. Thank you so much, Phil. Hey, take care and have a good I'm trying to think what what just stay well. All right. Okay. Just stay well. And hopefully we'll see you again. You too, buddy. Th- thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Phil Yeager. And once again, every Tuesday we have a new show and we bring in people like Shaheen and, uh, Something that's a little more different. Look at him. He, he froze now. And <laughs> he, But no, he, that was a good picture, Shane. Where'd you get that picture done? I like that. Uh, photographer, local photographer here. Okay. All right. And, uh, but anyway, very interesting in what you do and how you made it. And uh, I enjoyed it. I really do. I don't enjoy every conversation, but this was enjoyable. And I laughed. <laughs> and I hope I gave you a laugh in some way. But anyway, take care. Everyone, give us a holler if you want a specific topic, and we will do it. So anyway, we wish everyone good day, stay well, and once again, be nice to each other. Because I'll tell you, I thought 
after this COVID thing, people might be a little nicer, but they're getting nastier by the moment. But anyway, you don't have to be that way. Shaheem, thank you very much. Take care. And hopefully I'll talk to you again.